Sam, I thank you for reading that prayer. How many of you noticed that she stopped before the end? Mm. Check in Luke sometime and you'll find that that's the way it is. I'm going to give our boys and girls an opportunity to do something today. I'm going to say one word quite a few times. Boys and girls, where are you? Would you raise your hand? Wherever we have boys and girls, can I see it? I see some 50-year-old hands going up here. All right. I would like to ask boys and girls to check on something for me today. And that is, I'm going to say the word pray or prayer. Those, either of those two, same thing. And if you would count, every time you hear me say that word, prayer or pray, just make a mark either on your dad's hand or on the bulletin or something, and then count it and tell me at the door when we go. And I'm going to go on, which door am I going to go? Probably this side. And if you see me, you tell me how many times. And if you get near a thousand, you just put your hand up and I'll see I need to stop by that time. All right, thank you very much. So I'd like to ask for us to bow our heads in a, in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, it's wonderful to know that the one that we speak to can teach us how to do it. The most important thing I ask, Lord, is that you would help us to realize how much it thrills you when we pray. So today, if we've got to learn it over, help us to be willing to do that. Amen. So how many times do you think we have already prayed today in this worship service? If songs and scriptures that praise God and lift Him up, if they count, maybe we're around six to eight, maybe ten. And then there are all the silent prayers that have been going on here today. And there is a prayer vigil going on. It matters to me how much I pray. It matters how much we pray as a church. In fact, if you turn to the book of Matthew and you read all through it, you'll find that 19 times in the book of Matthew, prayer and Jesus are connected. There's one place where Jesus says, you can ask for anything in my name, and if you believe it, you will get it. I've often thought about that part of the prayer that Jesus taught us about. So let me ask you a question. If you knew for sure, having read that verse from Jesus, if you knew for sure that whatever you ask him for, that you are guaranteed <clears throat> to get it, guaranteed that he would give it to you just as you asked for it, would you pray more? Would you pray more than you pray now? Well, one guy decided that the way to do that is he would... Um, program his computer to go through a whole list of prayer requests every morning, and his computer would work through the list while he slept. It seems like how much we pray is not as important as why we pray. And one thing I want you to understand is that if you do get why we pray, it'll have a lot to do with how we pray, when we pray, and what we don't pray. The big issue is why we pray. Now, those people in the time of Jesus, the Pharisees, the religious rulers, the scribes, the teachers of the law, they didn't get the why of praying. They didn't get it. To them, praying was something to prove how religious they were. Praying was to show how impressive their religious lives, their piety was. And that kind of made Jesus sick. He hated that. It was so nauseating to him. So he said to his disciples one day, don't be like them, but pray like this. And then it is that Jesus gave what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Many Christians have memorized the Lord's Prayer. Only from Matthew, though. I haven't found anyone reciting Luke, chapter 11, where Luke records the Lord's Prayer, because it's shorter. Somebody once counted that 
on one particular day, throughout the world, two billion Christians, how many? Two billion Christians prayed the Lord's Prayer on that one particular day in all churches of all religions throughout the world. People have made a habit out of it. And that's why Martin Luther came out and said the Lord's Prayer is the greatest martyr for everybody tortures and abuses it by babbling and mumbling through it thoughtlessly. I've done that, haven't you? Going through the Lord's Prayer like it is something just that we memorize as a child, put it to memory so we can recite it, not thinking very much about really what it says. So try this. Take the Lord's Prayer line by line so that each line is, a, is like a bone and then let the Holy Spirit add the flesh to the bone. The Lord's Prayer can be exceptionally meaningful if we don't use it as a formula, but use it as a guide, which Jesus gave us. So how is Jesus going to do that? He come, takes us to Luke chapter 1, and Luke is the only book of the Gospels that actually says this, that once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, what did they say? Teach us to pray. Now, those disciples often saw Jesus praying. But they not only saw Jesus praying, they also saw Jesus live. And they saw how that his praying and his living matched. They also saw how the Pharisees prayed a whole lot. And they noticed that the Pharisees' living and their praying did not match. Because it is not well for us to pray cream and live skim milk. And that's why those disciples say to Jesus, please, teach us to pray. We're not interested in praying like the Pharisees. That's not what we want you to do. We can see the gap between their cream and their skim milk. We can see the difference. We don't want that kind of praying. We want, Jesus, for you to teach us to pray so that what we pray will be what we live. Show us how, because we see it in your life. Teach us to pray. Is that the prayer you want to pray? That's a learning experience. Please don't say, oh, Jesus taught them how to pray. He taught them why to pray. Because the why has everything to do with how we pray, when we pray, and what we do not pray. Do you get the difference? The how to pray is well worked out by the Pharisees. Big words, wonderful flowery expressions, very impressive, grand, and very, very religious. They got the how right. But they missed out on the why. They did not know even the God that they were praying to. So why pray? Let Jesus show us why to pray. How does he begin? He says, our Father in heaven. In those four words, divided in two, the first two immediately help us to understand that God is intimately close to us, but then the next two immediately says he is distant from us. So that in the same breath, what we're actually finding out is that there is loving intimacy and there is awful reverence all combined together with God. It's almost like two big oceans coming and meeting one another at one place. And when you go down to the very southern tip of Africa, you've got the Atlantic Ocean, you've got the Indian Ocean, one is warm water, the other is cold water, and where they meet, you can see, yes, a blending, but also a contrast. And this is what we got here when we're praying, our Father in heaven. We've got this intimacy, and we've got this closeness. 
but we'll also have the reverence and the greatness of God. Well, I want you to notice that the very first word Jesus uses is what? Our. And this links the prayer, the one doing the praying, links the prayer with fellow believers. You will not find one place in this Lord's Prayer where it talks about I, me, or my. It's absent. You cannot pray and say, give me today the food that I need. You'll be changing the prayer that Jesus gave. All through, it is our. It's impossible to pray it any other way, the way Jesus gave it. You see, when I make my prayer so personal that it's all about me, it so easily can become self-centered. Now, I'm not saying you should never pray by saying me and my. Certainly, that it even happens in the Bible, John 17. Jesus does that. But Jesus is teaching us here a new pattern. Instead of saying, Lord, bless me, bless my wife, bless my daughter, bless my son, bless we four and no more, amen. No, instead of that, God, Jesus says, I want you to say our every time. Why is he doing that? It's because Jesus is saying the reason why you pray, why do you pray, is that you're building community. You are building unity. You are joining yourselves to others. You are more concerned about being part of the body of believers than you are concerned about what your personal needs are. So why pray? To build community, to build unity. That alone changes the entire purpose, the why for the Lord's Prayer. And then Jesus says, Father, our Father. In the Hebrew and the Aramaic, it's Abba. Closest English word we have to that is what? Daddy. Really? Father doesn't quite do it. There's an intimacy with daddy that is much closer to it. Daddy. Where Jesus wants us to see his father and our father, the same being, and Jesus, therefore, our older brother, to see God as a loving, caring, tender, and very protecting father. A daddy. I don't know how many of you have tried praying that way and looking to heaven saying, Daddy, our Father. That was revolutionary for that time. The people of that time saw God in the most holy place, separated from them by a very thick curtain where they could not penetrate. He was too holy. He was too distant. He was too awesome. And here comes Jesus and he says, that holy father, that holy God is your father. He is intimately close to you like your dad. Whole new way of thinking about God. Whole new way. Whole new way. Maybe you don't have good memories of your father. That is why he's called the heavenly dad. Because he is different even from our earthly fathers who do fail us. Why pray? Is to remind us that God is daddy. cares about us. He feels what we feel. You are never not on his mind. There is never a pause when he is forgetting you so that he can remember someone else. His infinite mind keeps you on the forefront all the time. I used to hitchhike home from boarding school, days when it was a little safer. And I loved to do that when my parents didn't know I was doing it. They thought I was on the train, but hitchhiking was usually quicker and much cheaper. And I used to surprise my father, go to his workplace, walk down to where he is, 
And as I walked into his workplace and he saw me, I could never imagine that at that moment I would go on my knees and crawl towards him, studying his face to see if he's angry at me. And then I'll look up to him and say, oh, thou great one, you who are so powerful, you can carry me and my bicycle. Thou who sayest something and it is immediately done. Thou who dost own everything in the house, even my toys. Oh, have mercy upon me, thou great one. My dad would say, knock it off, man. I'm your dad. And it's an embrace. There's a kiss. There is a smile, a happiness for this union, this coming together, this finding one another. And there's an intimacy. Formalities are put aside. He is dad. Why would we think any less of our heavenly father? Dad is that endearing name, that affectionate name, that trusting, that way of addressing a father. It's like a young child, sometimes the first words coming out a little baby is, Dada? We're still babes. Here's our dad. But there's more. He is intimate and he is holy. There was a time when your name actually told people what you did for a living. John Smith here would be the ironsmith in town. Fred Baker would be the baker in town. And Jim Carpenter would be the guy who did the carpentry. Well, what about God? His name tells us what he does. What does he do? He's creator. He created the universe. He created the world. He is sovereign Lord. He rules over everything. What does he do? He loves he saves. He wins hearts. He does things that no one else can do. That's why he's holy. He alone can do what he does. Therefore, he's set apart, and we call him Holy God. And Jesus wants us to remember this God that he is saying we can call Father and Daddy. We can worship him because he can do what no one else can do. He is infinite. He is Wonderful. We worship Him. So why pray? I'll tell you the reason to pray, my friends, is to get our minds filled with who God is. Amazing how things change in their priorities when that happens. Who God is. God is holy. And with God big in our minds, we're ready to talk to Him about our needs. Only when he is big in our minds. And then when we say to him, give us today the food we need. We're not telling God anything that he doesn't know. Why are we doing that? In fact, you may repeatedly tell God what you need. The same thing over and over every day. Is that being repetitive? We're not telling God what he needs to know. What we're doing is we are setting our minds in the right frame of thinking that we are dependent on God. That we are in fact the ones who look to him for what we need. And that trusting relationship is what we are developing with him when we tell him what our needs are. We never tell him what to do for us. We tell him what our needs are. We tell him that we depend on him. And that puts us in the right position as human beings, that we are dependent on God. Now, sometimes maybe you feel that what you ask God is a need, He just doesn't give it to you. Lord, this is my need. I'm not asking you for what I want. I'm asking you what I need, and God never does that. It seems He's taking ever so long. Well, consider this. When the idea is not right, God says no. And when the time is not right, God says slow. And when we are not right, God says, grow. And when everything is right, he says, go. There's a verse in the Bible that says, God will always do what is right for those who cry to him day and night. 
for what their needs are. Always will do what is right. So our need is for basic things like bread. Our need is also to be forgiven. Forgive us our sins. That's where we go to the cross. That's where we go to God admitting that we are at fault, that we are wrong. That's where we are reminded that Jesus, our big brother, actually paid our debt, and we simply, humbly, and frequently confess our sins to our dad and remind ourselves of his grace. He is never waiting for us to confess so thoroughly, so perfectly, so completely before he comes to us with his forgiving hug. It is within his hug that we confess because we've come to our dad who unconditionally loves us. I wish it would stop here, where it simply says, forgive us our sins. But we have to also pray, and will you pray this one with me? As we forgive those who have sinned against us. In other words, Father, only forgive me if I forgive the one who sins against me. Would you rather skip that part of the prayer? It's kind of nicer to just skip that part. And yet, it is vitally important because our dad says that if you're unwilling to forgive others, you haven't yet appreciated, you haven't yet grasped, you haven't yet experienced the warmth of my forgiveness because my forgiveness is so big, it even includes the one that you don't like, the one who has hurt you. It includes that person. We pray in order that we will be reconciled. Purpose of prayer. Purpose of prayer. And he says, listen, don't let us yield to temptation, Lord, but rescue us from the evil one. At the end of the day, you know what's important to God is that we would be like dad. That's why temptation has to be moved, has to be overcome, so that we will be like dad. That's his purpose. That is what he's saying to us. And then for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, which is added later on, but it is a great doxology to add to that prayer. You see, the prayer begins with us identifying God for who He is, and the prayer ends with us being reminded that He is in charge. Thine is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. He's in charge, and if He's in charge, I am not. And if He is powerful, I am not. And if all glory, all credit, all applause goes to him, there's none left for my ego to be swelled by. So it's a glorious way. It's a very fitting way to conclude this prayer. And it tells us why we pray. To fill our minds with this big God, this wonderful dad. To fill our minds and to grow in an attitude of dependence on our dad. And how do we pray? There is a little bit of how we pray that is mixed in here. Philip Yancey puts it well. He says, keep it honest, keep it simple, and what? Keep it up. Keep it up. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 18, you'll find there a story where Jesus tells his disciples, he says, I'm going to tell you a story to show that You should always pray and never give up. Keep it up, he says. You should always pray. He tells him that story. Here are the stories to tell you. You should always pray and keep it up. And then at the end of the story, Jesus says, when the Son of Man returns, how many people will he find on earth who have faith? I want you to think just quickly about those two statements. The first one is, he says, I'm going to tell you a story so that you will know never to stop praying, to always pray and keep it up. And at the end of the story, he says, when the Son of Man comes back, the second coming, how many people will he find having faith? And I wondered, you know, why is Jesus making those two statements, the one at the beginning of the story and one at the end of the story? 
And then I had to go to chapter 17 of Luke, and I found there that Jesus is telling them, he says, you know, when I come back, it'll be, the days on the earth will be like the days of Lot. And what did the people do in the days of Lot? He says, they married, they ate, they drank, they worked, all the ordinary stuff. But he says, when the Son of Man comes, just like when Sodom was destroyed, they were not ready. Because for them it was business as usual. Their minds were on the usual things of life. Their minds were not set on their daddy, their God, their father. They were more occupied with that which is usual. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus never mentions once their sins, though elsewhere in the Bible they do. But Jesus doesn't say the people in the days of Lot were burned by that fire because of these sins and list them up. No, no. He says they were lost because for them life was business as usual. So that when the Son of Man comes back, he says, it is not so much how wicked the people are. The problem is, just like it was in the days of Lot, so it'll be in the days when Jesus comes, where for many it will be business as usual. May I suggest to you that the threat of godliness, of being like Jesus, is not just sins, it is everyday life. Jesus points in the days of Lot to good things. It's good to eat. It's good to drink. It's good to marry. It's good to work. But there is something evil about the ordinary things. If God is not at the center, if it's not done for him, it's not done to him and with him. You see, your and my big battle, friends, is business as usual. We're occupied with eating and shopping and driving and vacationing and going to school and working. There's nothing wrong with these things absolutely by themselves, but the battle is to keep God in our living, which means it will not be business as usual. It will be unusual because everybody will see that these people are different in the way they live and they work, they vacation, and they relate to each other. They do it differently. They're not sucked in by Madison Avenue that every advert captures them and turns them into a slave. They can shop with God at their side. And the results are they're not in deep debt. The result is they're not captured by their senses. The result is that God is glorified by the use of that credit card. If you think that's possible. And here Jesus says, I don't want you to be lost like the people in the days of Lot. And those who are saved, Jesus says, are the ones who always pray and never give up. Because it's in their praying that their lives are not life as usual, business as usual. In their praying, what is happening is they are developing their awareness of God as daddy. They're developing their need with, for God as a dependence upon Him. And their lives are different because they are praying. So that, yes, they do dress, they do eat, they do drink, they do work, they do vacation, they do go to school, they do teach, they do all those things, but they are doing it as an outflow of prayer which connects them with Daddy and which keeps them in dependence of Him. Dependence of Him. And therefore, when the Son of Man comes, He will find faith in them. They have a faith that has been kept strong, that has been kept alive by prayer that never ceases. They keep it up. It's like this. In Jesus' mind, praying and believing goes together. For those who keep praying, for whom prayer is growing a big picture of God, of daddy in their minds, and of which everything is placing me dependent on him. For those, faith stays alive. Secularism cannot dilute it. 
Struggle and trouble cannot destroy it. It's impossible to be lukewarm because when you keep praying and keep it up and never stop that, you will have the flame of faith burning. It's like this. You ever been to the locomotive train, that steam engine? And you look inside there and you find that furnace that is ablaze. And that fire, that furnace, guess what that is? That is faith. But there is fuel that goes into that furnace. And that fuel, the coal, what does that represent? That represents the righteousness of Christ, salvation by grace, salvation through Jesus Christ, that I need to repeatedly grow strong in my heart and in my mind. And the shovel is prayer. Where through prayer, I'm reminding myself of Daddy and my dependence on Him. And through doing that constantly, I'm shoveling the fuel of salvation by grace into that fire. And my faith keeps alive through prayer as I shovel in the righteousness of Christ, the salvation by grace. What happens if I stop shoveling? If I put the shovel down and I stop fueling that fire, you know what's going to happen? That fire is going to grow weak. It's going to eventually turn lukewarm, and it's going to go out. Keep shoveling. Keep shoveling the fuel. Salvation by grace in Jesus Christ. We've got to meditate on that every day. It's got to be part of our prayers. It's got to be part of our study. Yeah, the law will take care of itself, friends, when your eyes are on Jesus. Don't study the law because the law is supposed to just make you sense your guilt to send you back to Jesus Christ. Keep fueling your faith with Jesus Christ and fuel it by that kind of prayer as Jesus taught us why to pray. Why to pray. Keep shoveling. Now, why do you want to do that? You want to do that simply because your daddy loves you. He has saved you by his grace. And you've discovered that he has reached down and he's taken hold of your life. And he has turned that prayer life into the most thrilling experience of your day. If you're not there, pray for it. Pray for it.